and usually I see not much attention being paid to the to the energy source. That's usually an external lipid source, that it be fat and oil, and and it's just there and and people move on obviously to other nutrients. And I think it pays to understand a little bit deeper the saturated and unsaturated fatty acid ratios of our dietary energy sources. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Karen Grogan. I'm your host today for the Poultry Podcast Show. And today we have a uh, global nutritionist who works in um, the food production industry. And um, he is known by Shandor. He is a Hungarian and he tried to teach me how to pronounce his last name. Um, so we're just gonna stick to uh, his first name, Shandor, while we're here on the podcast. So welcome today. Thank you, Karen. Yes, my name is Shandor, and welcome, everyone. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background and your training and, and what you do in the industry right now. Thank you, Karen, for the question. I, I consider myself as a practical nutritionist, and uh, I have been working in the international feed additive industry for the last 25 years. And... Um, by education, um, I did a PhD in University of Minnesota, a completely different subject, but I, I got interested in nutrition and I have been doing it ever since. I started out with swine and then progressed more into poultry species, especially so when I'm, since I have been associated with this company in the last eight years. So we are focusing our activity in the poultry sector. And that's where I'm working with clients. Excellent. And and what uh, what part of the world do you primarily focus your um, support and service to? I'm in transition, actually. The last uh, six years or so, I have been stationed in Singapore. And I serviced our company's Southeast Asian and Middle Eastern customers, including Northeast Asia occasionally. Okay. And I'm in transition because I'm transferring back more to Europe and I will be stationed in our Hamburg headquarters and uh, I will be responsible for the global technical support in poultry. Excellent. Thank well, you. good luck on the international move. Thank you. Have you moved? Are, are you in Germany now? No, I'm in Hungary okay. at the moment. Hungary. Okay. So I will be moving in June, hopefully. Nice. Well, good luck. I uh, I have a previous experience working uh, with for a German company as well, so um, I, I enjoyed the the few trips I got to take to Germany. So um, good luck in that move. <clears throat> so, in in terms of um, nutrition aspects related to poultry, um, your your area of sort of interest and focus tends to be uh, lipids and lipid metabolism. Um, so, what what about this is it a topic that that you think is important and why it should be a focus in terms of um, poultry production? It's very interesting because uh, our company is specializing in in functional lipids. In other words, we are the ones who are responsible for managing the dietary energy and we do it with our specific products uh, hot topic nowadays is gut health of course and the medium chain fatty acids and their derivatives but today i chose a topic apart from this a little bit because everyone is talking about gut health so why not talk something else or that is related also to gut health and all too often um I love feed formulation. So when I when I visit clients and we got into the discussion, I try to find out how is their formulation look like, and and usually I see not much attention being paid to the to the energy source. That's usually an external lipid source, that it be fat and oil, and and it's just there, and and people move on obviously to other nutrients, and. I think it pays to understand a little bit deeper the saturated and unsaturated fatty acid ratios of our 
dietary energy sources. So for, for people that might be listening that are not nutritionists, could you just quickly explain the difference in saturated and unsaturated fat and, and how they differ in their energy source? Oh my goodness, this is one of those hardest questions when you ask a professional person how to explain right. a simple Maybe, chemistry. You know, we, we have different levels of people that might be listening. So um, if you haven't had a nutrition course, or for some of us, it's been a really long time since we've had a nutrition course, um, just, you know, a brief explanation of, <laughs> of what's the difference between those two. Sometimes the saturated fat, when people hear about this, they are associated with absolutely negative connotations and, and, um, but this is part of, part of life and, uh, the saturated fatty acids, uh, when the carbon chain, if you remember from your high school chemistry, are connected either with um, the double bond or triple bond in certain cases, but in the saturated fatty acids, only one bond connecting the the carbon atoms and the rest of the other free, um, uh, how to say it in, in simple chemistry, are coupled by the hydrogen atom, so it's it's all um, kind of saturated, so to speak. So when you find um, a double bond, as an example, or several double bonds along the chain of uh, connected carbon atoms, then we talk about unsaturated fatty acids. And usually these are associated with health or special properties and it makes the external lipid source probably more flowable or more resistant to freezing, in other words. So unsaturated double bonds, saturated single bonds, back to basic, plus plus some extra details. So A little bit more complicated than that. But. More complicated, <laughs> yes. So there's a, there's a structural difference. So there, and then... You know, some of their properties would be would be different as well. Yes, and this is affecting their digestibility, and uh, this is probably more for the nutritionists. Uh, the more saturated you have, it's associated to be less digestible. Okay. Um, it's not entirely correct to say, however, because when we read the scientific articles and research. Um, let's take an example, stearic acid. Stearic acid is the major component of, of candles, as an example. Mm. They're solid on room, in room temperature. They're absolutely uh, not digestible for, for the monogastric species or very little digestibility is there. Let's say up to 40%, 45 maybe. The remainder is not digestible. It doesn't do good to feed such a fatty acid right. to, to poultry species. And we are more focused on the C16 and upwards, so the longer chain, longer um, chain. Uh, fatty, okay. fatty acids. Let it be saturated and unsaturated. Okay. So the, 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 the longer chain um, types of compounds, like what are, what are some examples of those? And then what, how does their digestibility compare to the one you just gave an example of? Let's start with uh, the most popular one that everybody knows, probably palmitic acid. Let it be in a positive or negative connotation. Palmitic acid is palmitic acid. Uh, the name itself is related to the palm tree, palm oil. Uh, but technically, this is a very, very important molecule that we as nutritionists, especially nutritionists interested in lipid nutrition have to pay a lot of attention to. And palmitic acid is, is 16 carbon atoms connected by the single bonds. So they are saturated fatty acid. And um, we go stepwise in double. In other words, the next one we talk about is C18. And if there is a, also a saturated fatty acid that we're talking about, then we have the stearic acid. And if we introduce one unsaturated, then we oleic acid. So when people go to the store, for those who are not nutritionists, usually this is what you see when you go to the, the cooking oil section of the store, the liquid oil room temperature, they most likely they contain high levels of oleic acid, linoleic acid, and linolenic acid, and so on. So the, the longer they are and more unsaturated, the more flowable. 
that's that, that that could be the general rule of thumb. Excellent. So in terms of, you know, we're, we're, we're always in this least cost, as you were just explaining, it's, you know, a, you know, a large, you know, two thirds to three fourths of your cost. So what, how can you deal with, as you're, you're explaining these fat sources, you know, we're usually byproducts, they want the cheapest version available. And then as you're explaining in, in kind of these developing industries, it's really a challenge um, in less developed areas to get fats and, and store them to prevent this rancidity. So how could those challenges be addressed? Um, are there, are there certain, certain fats that are more stable? Are there, uh, there are, you know, um, I guess like preservatives, um, that are, that are added to the fat or things to decrease how, how they, you know, basically to allow them to be stored longer. So how could we address some of those challenges? Because I think that's a, a global challenge is, um, you know, we want production to increase in some of those areas. And uh, I, I think they have other nutrition challenges, but um, what are some potential ways that that could be tackled? Oh, Karen, you said it right. Um, I think the one of the key words that you said is the more stable so, so sometimes when you have a, a so many times the feed manufacturers and the farmers integrations do not have the choice. So they buy into a lot, it comes bad, what to do with it, right? We have to feed it as soon as possible or get rid of it. Uh, another alternative solution is to understanding the saturation level or the fatty acid profile. Plus, you have to also understand the peroxide values, the acid value, and all these chemical values. And then you can make a conscientious decision. And this is where our company comes into hand, and also other companies who specialize in this, that we introduce into the system a stable, a purposely made stability. And then when the blending process can start, and this is the topic of our discussion, I think, for today, briefly, that it is worth understanding the fatty acid profile, first and foremost. It is worth understanding the ratio of total saturated and total unsaturated fatty acid ratios. And it's necessary to to inject a stable source to mitigate some of the effects of these negative ratios of the saturated and unsaturated. And if there is rancidity, you can dilute it. So we can we can provide as a dilution factor. Dilution is the solution to <laughs> That's <laughs> go right. back to that same old thing. If we're talking about mycotoxins, we're talking about rancid fats, like it's the same discussion. Like just, you know, meter it out so then hopefully the effects. But I think what what we tend to see is we're layering on all of those things that we're trying, you know, the grains come with a certain level of mycotoxins. There's a certain level of quality issues with the fat. You know, we might have a, a feed production quality issue, like in terms of pellet quality, like that's been discussed on here before. So there's just so many um, things that go into make issues with making quality feed. Um, so it, it really takes a, a holistic approach. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, the holistic approach helps a lot. Um, um, sometimes we nutritionists, we get into to discussions of EDBD details on data sets and then and the actual values of, let's say, what is the, the digestible lysine to digestible threonine ratio for, for pullets, as an example. And we, we can debate for hours and back and forth. What, what I observe, uh, actually, the holistic approach helps a lot. And many times, many times veterinarian colleagues are doing a fantastic and heroic job in this respect because they have a different perspective to look at things. Uh, they also have their limitations. So I think we have to offer a hand-in-hand and a cooperative approach. I consider myself more as a uh, tech, uh, practical nutritionist. So I try to look at the, the, the dietary uh, factors. What does it mean? I look at first and foremost, what is the energy level? What is the lipid source they use? And 
all, all too often, of course, producers and farmers go for the cheapest input cost, obviously. And this is soy oil. There's nothing wrong with it. If it's fresh and well-made, perfect. But when it's getting rancid, unfortunately, and it is unfortunately getting rancid very fast and the impurities further exacerbate the problem, then we can have this uh, latent and then more prevalent uh, inflammatory re at the gut level. And then we, we then the farmers observe that the feed conversion, the feed efficiency is suffering, the birds just don't grow. And then there's a, there's a problem with the hatchery, that substandard deol chicks are coming, and then it's the whole mess, right? So we have to start somewhere. And I think the first and foremost, energy. And we all understand as nutritionists that the energy source is, is in the one hand, we can we can calculate, we can, we can count how many different sources we have. So it's not a rocket science. Um, but what we don't know, what do not do, my colleagues, with all due respect for the exceptions, we do not care too much about the, the fatty acid profile, right? It's soy oil, it's cheap, it's nice and good, sunflower oil, and that's it. Right. You account for this amount of energy for what you're including in your formulation. Done. Yeah, exactly. Move on. Yeah, to the next more interesting and more specific approaches. I don't blame them. They also are stressed and don't have the time. But uh, in the last five to six years, I have been reading a lot of papers on this. And, and it's very interesting that if we try to mimic the species-specific fatty acid profile, what does it mean? Let's let's choose the subject of broilers. The and the industry is using rendered chicken fat or, or yellow grease. Uh, I remember when I was in a student in university, Minnesota at that time, the turkey industry was booming. And I went to one of these um, turkey processing plants and they collected the, the, the offal and the offal fat, right? And and it was it was a wonderful product actually. So so many times in other parts of the world when it's a, when it is allowed to be fed back, um, it's a wonderful energy source and cheap. But of course, prone to rancidity because it's already processed once, right? So what can we do? And why do I say that we try to mimic? Because if you look at the total saturated fatty acids versus total unsaturated fatty acids, the ratio is about 30 to 70 percent in, in rendered poultry grease or yellow grease. And if we try to mimic this total saturated fatty acid and un, unsaturated fatty acid ratio at the dietary level, it's, it's a huge leap for, for more success. Why do I say this? Because many times if you only feed one type of fat as soy oil. The soy oil has about 15 up to maximum 20% total saturated fats and the remainder 80% plus is unsaturated fat. So this is not native. So it's kind of um, um, not mimicking properly this, this fatty acid ratios at dietary level and the 80 plus percentage of total unsaturated fats, if it's a feed grade soy oil, you can imagine the rancidity, the impurities and so on, causing a problem. So what do we do? What do we do recommend when we talk to colleagues or when, when we talk to farmers and integrations? Please increase the saturated fatty acid ratio from this, let's say 20% up to 30, no more. And this is where we introduce the products, what we are producing, just specifically for this purpose, so blending can start. And we're using palmitic acid-based products because palmitic acid is one of those wonderful molecules where they can, the body can use it for energy, can, can burn it for, for pure energy, and also can further process it to create more specific biosignaling molecules. So this is so this is a very interesting. Uh, the palmitic acid had has been kind of rediscovered a little bit under the radar screen, and this is where we are specializing, and that's where we introduce. Okay, increase the total saturated fatty acid ratio to thirty percent, and re leave the rest of the 
unsaturated fatty acid coming from soy oil, it's fine. Mm -hmm. So how does that, where does that blending step occur? Is that occurring at the feed mill level or is that occurring like at, at your fat, you know, the soy oil company blending that? Like, how does that happen? I think uh, the easiest uh, way would be at the feed manufacturing site, obviously, okay. where they, they have the necessary outside tanks or they can, they can also handle dry fats, powder fats. And, okay. and, you know, the interesting thing is that depending on the fatty, fat source, uh, especially in North America, as an example, or in Europe, Northern Europe, usually these tanks are, are having an internal heating system plus a stirring effect. You need to stir. So it's easy, easy to keep them at the specific temperature that they are flowable and it's nicely can be introduced into the mixer. And then also the the blending fat can be either liquid or dry fat, depending okay. on the source. So, I, again, I'm not a I'm a, I'm just a veterinarian. I'm not a nutritionist. But my understanding is those fats, like you were saying, they're like kind of sprayed into the mixer. So you would have your normal fat source sprayed, and then this palmitic acid portion sprayed, and in no, the correct dry, ratio. So it's a dry. It's a dry. It's a dry. It's a powder. powder. It's a powder. Okay. Right. Okay. So they're not. I guess in my head, when you were describing blending it, like it would be blended together first and then sprayed as one fat source. But basically, they're going into the formulation independently. Correct. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. I wasn't succinct okay. about the specific. So they meet each other in the in the mixer. In the mixer. Okay. Yeah, that's the easiest way. I'm I'm a visual learner, so I have to like you know break it down, <laughs> break it down for my wait. How are they putting that in the feed, or is it going into the oil? So now I understand. So then, once we get this sort of mix, um, mixed formulation, just so that I, do, does the additional palmitic acid help to stabilize the other fat source, or are you just simply increasing the level of saturated um, fats that are available? Well, for one hand, when you introduce such a product into the mixture, it's it's already purposely made, so it's it's stable. Right. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't further cause problem. So, but it it can dilute the issue a little bit. But the most important fact is that it delivers palmitic acid, either in a triglyceride or in a pure form, depending on the type of fatty fatty acid or fat powder. And uh, some companies prefer to have the pure um, fractionated fatty acids, okay, which are not as a result of rancidity or decomposing of fatty acids, but purposely made. It's like fractionation. This is one hand. Or some other companies like the triglyceride versions of it. And um, because they're easy to dose, they can put up into the cells in the feed mills and then easy to measure out the proper ratios. So what we try to achieve is that in the diet, what gets in front of the chicken, the, the fatty acid profile already is very similar or mimicking what the chicken is own body is depositing. What they would want. Yes. Right. And we go even further in that a little bit because, you know, in chickens, uh, we are talking about influencing the the skin or subcutaneous fat. This is what we like, the crunchiness, the, the, the right. taste and all these things. Yes. And if you introduce a little bit more saturated fat versus just pure unsaturated fatty acids, the, the taste is getting better. The, the palatability of the particular chicken part is getting better. Plus, I, I was also surprised I learned it from the literature that uh, the chicken breast, usually we associate the chicken breast as dry. We have, we have to have some kind of sauce when, when we cook it. And so it's like um, we have to have additional things to be enjoyed it better. But if you feed a little bit of a palmitic acid and when you feed it with, in a diet which is mimicking the animal's own fat composition, the... The, the adipose tissue, adipose actually cells in the chicken breast are also getting bigger. So they increase the palatability mm. and, and uh, the enjoyment when you eat such a chicken breast is better. The, 
there are conditions, of course, that once you increase the total saturated fatty acid profile to 30%, at least half of that should be palmitic acid. And when you can achieve this, and this is where we are existing, we do it in a very good economically uh, affordable rate. But the end result, the, uh, to give you one example, um, the, in the Middle East, chicken uh, sausages. You know, usually in the past, when I tried chicken sausages, uh, they were not very palatable. They were a little bit dry not very enjoyable. So there's a requirement. So it should be nice and good to chew on, good to bite into it. And palmitic acid, together with this nutritional concept, can help to improve the the palatability of the end product. Plus, we had we have actually trials what we've done in our company. The trip loss can be influenced. So so in many many places the the frozen or prepared chicken is not 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 in fashion too much yet so they have they have the the live chickens and they hang it up or put into the freeze or um, kind of um refrigeration chicken parts so it's fresh not frozen and when you feed such a diet that is mimicking the fatty acid profile of the poultry then the drip loss is reduced by up to 25%. So in other words, you can display that chicken part a day longer or two days longer in the in the supermarket and this is where where things get very interesting. Your partner in improving animal performance, Berg and Schmidt. They believe the following additives are necessary in the poultry dietary. Functional lipids for an efficient dietary energy management. Phospholipids for emulsification, achieving a better nutrient intake. MCTs to provide energy and modulate the microflora within the intestines and enzymes for elevated use of fibrous materials and byproducts. One of AB Vista's core strategies is to give customers the flexibility to do more with less, which is a common theme among many companies and producers in today's industry. As a science-driven company, AB Vista has proven results to help our customers achieve optimal performance using customized programs with our core phytase and xylanase. JBI helps poultry producers fight against harmful pathogens with the foaming power of D7 disinfectant. JBI prevents costly outbreaks and assures eco-friendly biosecurity on farm and in transport. Safe and effective against AI, E. coli, Salmonella, cocci, dermatitis, and other illness causing pathogens. D7 is non toxic, providing a safer environment for you and your employees. Low corrosive to equipment and breaks down biofilms. Learn more at jbidistributors.com. So, I, <clears throat> what I would <clears throat> imagine that, that having the adipose tissue sort of the right composition, um, you know, we call that like we turn that yield. Um, so then your, you know, in product yield is just maintained, um, sort of on however it's presented, you know, in, in different areas of the world, um, product is sold differently. Um, but that's really interesting that, that having, having the fats in the correct ratio, um, improve, uh, in product. And it makes, it makes sense. You don't really think of, um, chickens being, you know, sort of like a, you know, we, we, we talk about beef cattle and marbling and, and, right. and a lot of in product discussions when we, when we talk about nutrition with other species, but we don't really necessarily for poultry. Um, but that's, that's really fascinating that you're having, um, an impact on, on in product. So, but of course, of course, if we a little bit dig deeper, just for one example in the, into the field of nutrition, of course, there is a de novo liponeogenesis happening also in chickens on, on demand. Um, this is grain related or, or driven by the, the carbohydrates available in the diet. The problem is what I observe, I remember back when I was in school, university, the chickens were at that time capped seven weeks to be able to reach 
two kilos. That was a long time ago, unfortunately. Today, we can get a two kilo chicken by 28 days. This is crazy, right? So the problem is they grow so fast, the genetic background enables them to do so, but we have a hard time keeping up nutritionally. And this is where there's not enough de novo liponeogenesis that can happen because this is just too fast. Things happen yeah. too fast. And we, so that, we have to give it to them in the feed. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and as I don't want to over uh, over discuss this topic. I think it's enough to make hopefully the listeners interested, and probably we can we can further um, explain it later. But we have we started our discussion today with gut health, right? And everybody talks about these magical fatty acids, medium chain, and so on, short chain, organic acid, blah blah blah. The combination of palmitic acid based products and there's a very interesting ratio to toy with these medium chain fatty acids, also saturated fats like coconut oil or palm kernel derivatives. We can actually really improve the feed efficiency of the birds. And we have concrete trials on this. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail. Hopefully we can connect later on with, with colleagues who are interested. But if you combine let's say 65% palmitic acid plus 5 to 10% um, coconut oil, as an example, then you can reduce or improve the feed efficiency over 5% plus. And this is serious money. So it's very interesting, but these are facts and these are published. But that's why when I, when I started to talk about this topic, apart from the mainstream a little bit, our, our nutritionist colleagues don't have the time now to read this through. And yeah, so, <laughs> oh it's, my it's, goodness, it's, Karen. I've, I've learned, I know I've, I've learned a lot because this, you know, I definitely, you know, I just get enough nutrition to, to, to deal with, you know, potentially nutritional diseases. Um, but I think that, uh, a lot of the information we've talked about is especially helpful in terms of, you know, all of this ties into sustainability, um, which is a huge push for our industry. Like, as you've talked about, like, we have to have sustainable sources for all of this. Um, we, 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 you know, fat sources globally are limited. Um, so I think that we have to, to start making smart choices in, in terms of, of what goes in and, and in terms of the ratio, I think all of us and our listeners have learned um, um, where that should be. And, you know, the chicken really wants this 30% ideal um, amount. So, um, so we'll, we'll wrap up the sort of scientific discussion there in terms of um, saturated and unsaturated fats. Um, so, You've had a, a very um, interesting career in terms of, of working in different parts of the globe. Um, what what advice would you give to someone who was, say, starting a new adventure in um, working in a different part of the world? Um, first and foremost, what I what I learned that was a hard lesson for me to learn. Uh, especially when I started my last 10 years exposure to Asian cultures, different Asian cultures, um, the ability to listen, to understand where the, the partner, the other side of the table is, is coming from. Because um, they don't have sometimes the luxury of uh, choices of raw materials available. Or sometimes in Asia, it happens very, very often. They change the formulation the same day because of availability. So, so those nutritionists are extremely challenged. The farmers are challenged. They, they're. Um, so this is one hand. So we need to be able to good to be good listeners, and we have to persist on 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 sharing the information. I remember when I started out, I was in the R&D section and it was hush-hush not to talk too much about composition of this and that. 
today it doesn't work because they people find out. But if you come to the clients with an open intentions and sharing information, bringing them the science, I think they appreciate that. And this is what we what we have to do as practical nutritionists, academic nutritionists, um, because in today's fast fast world. Um, um, hiding information doesn't pay at all. No, no, comes back to get you. And that's that's why we're doing this podcast, right? So, right, right. It's, it's information. wonderful. Information is power. I think that's great advice. Um, you know, good good communication is a two way street. Correct. You have to talk well, but you also have to listen even better. Absolutely. So, um, Shandor, it was a pleasure to have you on the show today, and um, I think that uh, we can definitely reconnect, and hopefully we can have another episode and um, delve into some more nutrition topics, and um, good luck in, in your move to Germany this summer. Thank you, Karen. Looking forward to it, and all the best to you as well. Excellent.